Thank you, everybody. Welcome, welcome back to Vermont House Judiciary Committee, and we are considering our uh, deliberations on S three. And I would now like to welcome uh, Kelly Carroll uh, to share her, her story with us. And Miss Carroll, I'm sorry that you that you had to to wait to testify, but I'm very glad that you're here. Um, thank you, and I hope you can hear me okay. Um, ab absolutely, and and as you know, we do stream on YouTube, so mm -hmm. um, we have no idea who's who's watching. Um, very likely, the press could be watching. Um, so just want to make sure you you're aware of that. And thank you yeah. so much, Maxine. We're not live yet. Oh, I see. Actually, I see it on mine. Oh, I don't have it on mine. We Interesting. Are. Huh. Okay. <laughs> huh. Okay. All right. Great. So, so welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you. I, and I and I want to thank everyone on the committee for um, allowing me to participate um, and share Emily's story. And I know that um, a certain incident or a certain case cannot determine law, but Emily's murder highlights a lot of the disconnects that were spoken about earlier this morning. And actually, thank you for letting me attend that because I found it quite informative. Um, but anyway, I just want to make sure that everyone knows that I firmly believe that, you know, when we talk about um, the people that we're talking about in S3, um, and I'm not really even sure of the correct term to use if it's mental health illness or mental health status or, or um, you know, what the correct term is. But I, I honestly believe when you talk about um, people that do have mental illness, that it is a very, very small percentage of the population that is violent. Um, I believe the majority, the vast majority of them are nonviolent. Um, I believe that um, people belong in our community. Um, but I do also think that there are the top, I guess there's two lists of 10 or 12 laws um, where there are some violent offenses. And I think that those need to be handled differently. So I just want to explain to you what um, happened to Emily, what I've learned. And I'm not a lawyer. Um, there's a lot I have to learn. I've been learning a lot, um, but I know that I still have a lot to learn. So um, basically on the morning of January 18th, it was Martin Luther King's day in downtown Bennington. And I'm not sure if you're all familiar with downtown Bennington, but there's a little river walk pathway by the Bank of Bennington. And it also goes by the Wollumsack Housing Apartments, which has about 50 units for seniors. And it was 11 o'clock on a Monday morning and there was a home health nurse that was coming out of the side door of the Wollumsack Apartments on the Riverwalk pathway. And she saw somebody suspicious hanging around in the tree areas and he scared her. So instead of walking down the path, which she would have had to have gone um, to get to her car, the bank was closed, so her car was in the bank parking lot. She walked down the snowy grass into the back side of the parking lot, got in her car, called her parents, um, and told her parents what was happening and, and said, what should I do? And her parents advised her to call 911. So she was on the phone with 911 explaining this when my daughter went walking up the walkway. Um, and she watched who we now know to be Darren Pronto um, stand up pull up his baggy pants, run after my five foot two, 120 pound daughter. And he's probably about 5'10", 5'11", goes a couple hundred pounds. Um, but he ran up on her. He tackled her from behind. He slit her throat. He got up. He ran away. And this was all narrated by a witness on a 911 call. There was another witness in um, the area that heard Emily screaming and saw it. Um, it was recorded on the Bank of Bennington video surveillance. It was recorded on a um, home surveil security surveillance. And um, because of the 911 call, one of the BPD officers was on his way to the call and actually caught Darren Pronto a couple of hundred yards from the murder scene, covered in Emily's blood, with the knife with Emily's blood on it, um, bragging to the cops that yes, he did what he did to Emily Grace and he can get away with it. Um, and BPD came to the house to tell us and, and um, right from the get go and even in our conversations with state's attorney, 
sheriff's office, we were told to not expect jail time with him, even though you would think two eyewitnesses caught at the scene, covered in blood on video surveillance, but he is going to get away with premeditated murder. Um, and like I said, I had no idea who he was. So I started to look into him. Um, and when you have something like this happen, it impacts your whole community. So people from the community started to tell us stuff. One of the first things I learned was that in November of 2020, which was about two months before he murdered Emily, he had made a video on Facebook laughing and claiming he's a murderer and he can get away with it, laughing about the laws, laughing about the police officer, laughing at all of us. Um, and he's right, he can, he can get away with it because in 2015, he was arrested. And I learned this, I thought he'd only been arrested a couple of times, but I was fortunate enough to testify on the Senate Judiciary Committee hearing and Senator Sears read his um, police record. So in 2015, he was actually arrested um, and the charge was false information, which we all know was probably modified from something else. And he was released with mental health conditions to UCS. In 2016, he was arrested for domestic assault and released with mental health conditions to UCS. Later on in 2016, he was again arrested for another domestic assault and released with stricter mental health conditions from UCS. And then in 2018, there was another incident, um, which he ended up going into the state hospital and you can't really find anything on that because of HIPAA. Um, and let me just say, I work in healthcare and I fully understand HIPAA and I respect HIPAA and I, and I get why, why we have HIPAA, but that whole danger to self or others, I do think needs to be um, at least a topic of conversation. Um, but in 2018, um, he was released from mental health from the state hospital. And again, you can't find it, except when you live in a small town like Bennington, you can find the victims and you can find out what happened. So he was um, having a fight with his mother apparently one day and punching holes in walls and scared his neighbor. And the neighbor could hear through the walls all the arguing and the F-bombs and everything and the mother pleading with him to stop punching the walls. And she got scared. So she waited, she didn't call the police right away. She talked with one of the other neighbors. They waited a couple of days and they called the police and the police came and they spoke with Darren Pronto and the mother outside. And the mother declined or denied everything, not declined, denied that anything ever happened, said the um, neighbors were just, were just out to get them and the police officer left. Well, after that, he went over to the neighbor that called, not the one, the, the lady originally, but the couple that was living next door. Um, and I believe this is also reported in the paper somewhere. Um, but he went over to them and was yelling outside for quite a while, threatening to beat the FNS out of them and calling them a lot of names and um, telling the man to come outside. And they didn't, they had called the police to come back. So um, during that time that it took the police to get there, he was getting more and more angered and he actually broke in the door and he did it so violently that he knocked the door right off of the hinges. And he was in there assaulting them and threatening to kill them and threatening to slit their throats when the police came. So they actually came and saved them, but there wasn't anybody there to save Emily. Um, he went into the court system. He went into the Department of Mental Health um, this was when he got his first not competent um, finding or label or I'm, I'm, again, I'm not quite sure of the term and I don't want to misspeak. But anyway, he got that first not competent and he went into Department of Mental Health custody and then um, he was basically released back into the community with nothing to just go and terrorize the community and he did. He was terrorizing. He made that video in November of 2020. And for months, he had been terrorizing the new neighbors and they had been calling the police. Um, I know one couple actually called the police, the state police four times. They only showed up twice. Um, some of this is hard to find, but again, small town. I know his mother. Um, and people are very forthcoming when things are happening like this because people are afraid that all of these disconnects in their system are gonna bring him back to our community. So her son and his girlfriend actually had to go and get a stalking order on him. So he's out with mental health conditions 
There's absolutely no follow-up. There's no requirement for him to continue with medications. He gets to self-medicate using crack. And he goes and, and tells his mother, basically three days before, he's going to kill my daughter by scratching murder time into the dining room wall or table. And nobody does anything. He's just allowed to continue. And for, I don't think that whatever, you know, I, I hate to play the what if game. You know, what if this issue had been addressed a couple of years ago, whether it be legislatively or through corrective mental health. But, you know, he he was allowed to deteriorate and get increasingly more violent and threaten more and more people in our community. And it's all documented. You can find it. You can check either um, some of the, the online newspapers or the banner. But he terrorized people when he lived in Bennington. He terrorized people when he lives down in Pownall. And he's basically a domestic terrorist because he doesn't have a political agenda. But there's a disconnect there that we need to do. We didn't do the right thing for my daughter. And we didn't do the right thing for the people in Pownall. And we're not doing the right thing for the people in Vermont because there's other cases like this that are happening. Now, granted, they may not be murders. And again, I firmly, firmly believe that people that have mental um, illnesses, it's a very, very small percentage that are violent. You know, most people don't go around slitting people's throats, but we've enabled him. We have empowered him and we have enabled him to get more and more, vi more violent because there are no um, interventions that are, that are working. Um, you know, I challenge you to, to get in touch with BPD and, and watch the video. Um, like I said, I've learned a lot. I watched the Senate hearings. Um, I watched, and I know I'm not going to pronounce this right, and I, I apologize, but I, I believe it's Mr. Valerio. Um, our Defender General had testified, and, and he had talked about things that the Vermont Supreme Court says about civil liberties. And again, I'm not a lawyer, but I'd like to know what the Vermont Supreme Court would have said to my daughter at her funeral about her civil liberties. Don't they matter? Does the public not have a right to public safety? Because if, if someone is a danger to themselves, I would suspect that it would be easy to get them treatment. Although I know from um, some issues that we had with my daughter and her depression um, and, and suicidal thoughts, that that's not all, always easy to get those services. So, um, but I would like to know what he would say about, or the Supreme Court would say about that with civil liberties, because I have to have some for protection. And, you know, and, and I, I heard about constitutionality. Um, on the hearings. And um, I heard that the attorney general and the defender general don't necessarily agree, agree on some things as far as constitutionality. And that's not for me because I'm not a lawyer and, and there's a lot of people on this committee who are much better to, to answer that question. But um, one thing that struck me that Mr. Rubin said was that he had looked at some other states and nobody else was really doing anything like this. Um, and, and I just have to say, that doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. I really don't think there's anything you know, wrong with Vermont being a leader. You know, if you look nationally, these issues are becoming um, more and more common, or maybe not more and more common, maybe more and more reported on, um, but there's, there's disconnects. And we did not do the right thing. We didn't do the right thing for the people in the state or the community. And, and I just think that, that we need to, to take a look at that. And I really hope that that S3 gets some serious consideration and it does get, get to a vote because it's, it's not gonna get any better. And you know, there's, there's mention of that psychiatric or the Connecticut Psychiatric Security Review Board. And the great thing about that is that it's multidisciplinary. You know, this is not a problem that one agency or one department can, can um, solve. And, you know, if you look at Department of Mental Health, they're looking at people and they're looking at getting people better. And if you look at the Department of Corrections, they want to keep people safe. And I really think that these departments and, and include Dial or um, Vermont Care Partners or anyone else that you want, these agencies need to partner together because this they're not geared to solve this individually. And they're not going to do this without legislation. It, it has to be addressed. And S3 isn't perfect. There's a lot of people that are gonna come up and say, you know, there's an issue with this and that, but it's at least a start because right now, these disconnects are allowing people to sometimes take advantage of the thing. You know, we're, we're going to talk about um, 
getting a, a court ordered evaluation, you know, in a non competent. Um, it's my understanding that the defense attorney can go and get um, somebody to evaluate and get a not competent prior to a court ordered evaluation. And they don't have to just go with the first one. They can get a couple, two, three, four, or however many they get until they get the result that they want. Um, and I know that in the last hearing, the um, Defender General said that this bill gives the um, prosecution the ability to go shopping around for an expert. But it's my understanding that the, the prosecution only gets to get one, one and done. They get you know one and they have to tell the defense. Um, so if this is the case, then maybe the defense attorney should just be able to get one and have to tell them, you know, if we have something serious medically, chances are we're going to go and get a second opinion. There's nothing wrong with getting that in, in a court. I think we owe it to um, the Vermonters in our state. I think we owe it to public safety. And I think we owe it to the people that are not getting the proper services through the Department of Mental Health. And one thing that I did learn was that there was a significant difference. Somebody had asked, and I, I apologize, I don't remember the names, but somebody had asked about contracts, for-profit, non-profit services. Well, my understanding, Vermont Care Partners um, oversees a bunch of individual contractors, uh, but services are not the same. And Erica Marthage testified that if she has somebody in Manchester that has mental issues, mental health issues, she refers them to Rutland because Rutland has a team. If somebody's having an issue, two people will come to the house. Um, there's a there, she used an example of a woman there whose son has PTSD and and he needs to stay medicated. The mother has a hard time with him. He gets violent. Um, and the Rutland team did have to come and take him into protective. I don't know if you call it custody or what, again, I don't have the right terms, um, for a couple of days and he takes his medicine and now she just has to say, don't, you know, do I need to call your caseworker and he'll comply and take the medicine. And then he's doing better and the, she's safer and not, not the community safer. But we don't have that in, in Bennington. Um, and I think that one thing that this bill will do with the, the forensic groups and stuff is that we'll take a look at that because you should, as you know, I, we're paying for it, taxpayers, we should have consistent services and we should have accountability for those services. DMH isn't handling it. They can't handle it. It's too much for them. And that's proven. You take a look at my daughter's case. Look at how many times Pronto got out with mental health conditions and he continued to get worse and worse and worse without intervention. So it needs to be a cross collaboration um, and maybe maybe for profits the way to go as opposed to nonprofit, because if you have somebody that's for profit and I'll be full disclosure, I work for a food contract management company. But if I don't hold up my end of the contract, we're gone. We are done. And some of my clients will push us harder for results as opposed to somebody who's nonprofit. So regardless of what you do on that end, you need to take a look at those nonprofits. You need to hold them accountable. And I think looking at the services and seeing what's different, whether it's within the prisons or without in the, in, in the community, I think having better services in the prisons is gonna help lower some of the, um, I think it just provides mental health services to some people who need it. And I think that's a significantly lacking area. So um, anyway, I just, I wanted to, um, to thank you for your time. Um, I just wanted to leave you with a thought about perception and reality. Um, I very, very, very much appreciate the opportunity to come here. But when I look at Darren Pronto's history um, and I look at things like the, the Novak, Novak case, I think it was where um, there was a couple of troopers and the state had to settle for time served and probation. Um, I don't agree with that. On a couple of different things, I think that number one, if if Mr. Novak needs services, he should get them, um, and the public needs to be safe. And I think that that's just an example of where um, mental health DOJ can just collaborate and do better for us all. So my perception has been that this issue has been spoken about and spoken about and spoken about. Um, I spoke with a couple of people from Leahy's office, Senator Leahy's office. And they told me that everybody talks about all the lack of services down here, but nobody does anything about it. So you have the opportunity to do them. You see the problems, you hear them. I live them. My family lives with them. Every day we see Emily's picture instead of Emily. You have the opportunity to fix that because S3 is not going to do anything for me or my family, but hopefully 
it will help people down the line, whether it's the people that are struggling with the illness or the people that the victims, if I am a victim, I'm a little confused on that today, but anyway, thank you very, very much for hearing me out. I do appreciate the opportunity and I thank you for everything that you do to help keep Vermont safe. I hope you pass S3 and I hope that everyone on the committee makes a commitment to public safety and mental health. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And of course, we are all so sorry for, for your loss. And, um, and I also really appreciate your, your ideas, your thoughts, your, your um, really thinking about it, as you said in your um, letter last night when we were in, um, uh, we we're going back and forth with our emails that you want to be part of a solution. And I can, I see that. And I, and I really do, do appreciate that. And um um, we'll be taking testimony this afternoon on Friday. Um, we'll be spending quite a bit of time on this bill as will, as will other committees. So, um, so I do very much, very much appreciate your, your testimony. Um, are, you, are you willing to take questions if anybody has questions? I really want to be part of the solution. I know people might not like what I have to say at times, but I really do want to be part of the solution. This has been an this has been a horrific experience for us. The more that we find out, the more frustrating it is. Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, one case should not define law, but one case can definitely highlight a lot of those disconnects that need to be addressed. And um, and I just hope that this year, unlike you know, last year because of COVID, and I really hope that something's addressed for future people. If not, there's gonna be, I guarantee you, he's gonna get out because there's nothing in the law that says that he can't. And when he gets out, I guarantee you, there's gonna be more bloodshed, there's gonna be more violence, there's gonna be more victims because he can and we've empowered him. So, but I'll take questions if anyone has one. Thank you. Uh, not, let me just check. Okay, not, I'm not seeing anybody. Thank oh, you. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, okay, Joanne Cortendick, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Yeah, that's correct. Can you hear me? Um, absolutely, welcome, thank you. Um, I can't, I don't, can't, un, I can't get the video on. Okay, I'm not, that, that, that's okay. I'm not sure. What, I'm, no, if um, anybody have any suggestions? Would, would you have a little X through it? <laughs> oh, okay. I had okay. I got a little. I got a, something here now. Okay, here I am. Hello. Hello. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. So um, my name is Joanne Cortendick, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak in front of you today. Um, I don't know if you all have seen my family statement or aware of my sister's case. Um, that statement was written by my cousin and I um, at the time my sister's killer died. Um, she was killed, she, uh, my sister was a um, resident of Burlington, Vermont, and she was, um, very active in her community. She was a social worker. She worked at Howard um, Center. Um, she worked with refugees. She was a single mom and an artist. Um, she had a connection with the person um, who killed her, but it was to a, a friend of hers. Um, and she was brutally murdered in a house um, intrusion in 2010. And he came in and he, um, tied her up, gagged her, um, ended up slitting her throat, stole her car, and um, abandoned it in a state preserve somewhere. I can't remember exactly. Um, and he was, um, she wasn't, because she was a single mom, single person, she um, was not found for several days. Um, because she did not show up at work on the Mondays when the, uh, uh, a, a check was done on her, a safety check, and her body was found. Um, he was later um, arrested on associate, um, unassociated charges on break-ins, um, and uh, he 
when when he was when he was apprehended, they were able to um, get his computer, on which he had. They showed that he had done searches for the knots that he used to tie her up, and also had done a search of the obituary columns to see if her name had popped up, um, and that was at a time when nobody else, nobody but he knew she was dead. So, I mean, it's clear from all the facts in this that this was a very deliberate action and um, he knew what he was doing before and after the crime. Um, so it, it's kind of difficult to describe the whole thing because this was such a long process. It was over a period of nine years that he bounced from the, the, um, the, the correctional um, system into the mental health system. And um, eventually, um, because he ended up dying because he had physical issue. Um, and uh, so that's when the case disappeared. So we went through many, many iterations of the competency, non-competency issue with him. Um, the reason I'm wanting to testify is um, I feel like I really understand what how difficult this process is for victims to walk through. I am an, I am a lawyer, and I have a cousin who's a lawyer who is also involved in looking at this case and following it all the way through. And I have a brother who is a correctional officer, so we we understand a lot of the different nuances. Whereas a lot of people who who, who are victims have no way of understanding or knowing how to navigate the system. So. My feeling is I want to do, as Kelly explained for her in her situation, as much as I possibly, possibly can do to help other people who are similarly situated. Um, so any improvements in the uh, victims' rights area um, are very important for those people who are in our situation. Well, my situation is quite different than Kelly because you know it went on for so, so many years and there were just so many different nuances going. Um, this, the problem with this particular defendant was he was very high. Um, he, he didn't have a lot of, of uh, aspects to him that he was able to operate pretty um, in a normal capacity in a lot of cases. So he had a very high understanding of the legal system and he used all of the disconnects that are present, some of which have to be because of the nature of the mental health situation. But he was very aware of what he was doing and in, in how he handled his case all the way through. Um, and once he got into the mental health system, that became much easier for him. Um, and so I am really wanting to, um, outline here a couple of the things that we observed over that time period um, where, where we think there could be improvements that could help, particularly in the case of like this, where the, he, the person is really highly, has high abilities. And I'll say this because if you look um, at the history of how this evolved over the years, um, it, examining psychiatrists, treating psychiatrists, and even the judge at the competency hearing, um, questioned continually whether his failure to cooperate was due to his deliberately being unwilling to cooperate versus actually having a, a mental con uh, condition that caused him to be unable to aid in his own defense. Um, so that was the problem. We, we were getting reports that he was competent and then they would, the prosecutor would bring in another um, expert who would say that he wasn't. And then we, we just, it just went on and on and on. Um, I would encourage you to look at the entire statement because it'll give you a better idea of what we went through during those, during that almost decade. Um, but here are a couple things that I really wanted to point out. Um, and some of this was mentioned by Kelly in her testimony. Um, I think one of the big issues is when that person is moved into the mental health system um, that there are um, disconnects between the two systems and that the focus in the mental health system um, is purely on 
um, giving the um, individual, treating the individual who has the mental health condition. Um, and then on the other side, the, the um, I'm sorry, I'm having a little migraine here right now. Um, this is all very stressful, I'm sure you can understand. Um, but um, so the disconnects are exacerbated by the fact that their communications are really cut off when someone goes into the mental health system. So it seems like the mental health system is doing what it wants to do to help the patient. And then the um, criminal side is inactive during that period because they aren't able to be active and they are not really hearing about what is going on on the other side. And so that's why I think the um, provisions of the bill that emphasize the uh, communication and notice, not, not just to um, the victims, but also the communications between the two systems, um, that there could be a lot of um, corrections or improvements. We as victims only get the communication that through the prosecutor's office, through the state's attorney. And when the person is moved into the mental health system, we just don't hear anything. And, and you can imagine how it would be if something like this happened in your family where you have your sister's been brutally murder, murdered or your loved one's been brutally murdered. And all you know is the person who did it. And there's quite a bit of evidence in, and which came out when he was first um, ordered into the hospital that he clearly was the killer. And, and also, obviously, as one of the representatives pointed out in the, uh, their discussion of the bill, the person is not convicted at that point, but there's enough evidence to show that there are, there are harm to others, that they are then hospitalized, which was the case with our, my sister's killer, alleged killer. So, um, I'm sorry, I kind of, so anyway, my point being is I feel like the more notice, the more information that's flowing between the two systems, the better. Um, and I know there are privacy issues here. I know there's HIPAA issues here, but I feel like there's so much pushback whenever um, somebody is in a situation um, that almost anything that you would say about them or what's going on with them would be defended by, we, we won't give you that information because it's HIPAA protected. Um, so I feel like this bill is really an important step in the right direction. I really feel particularly for people like Kelly where um, the person was released and their notices were not given that we don't, we weren't in that situation. Um, although he was released at the end of his life to go into the hospital and, and uh, there was no notice given to the um, public safety people when that happened or to us. Um, so there are, even, even with these laws in place, I feel like there can still be missteps. But I think, feel like the more um, ability to communicate between those systems is gonna see improvements um, with respect to getting that person actually to trial. And I, that's my second point. Um, and that is, um, there isn't, as that I can see, any effort at all on the mental health side to restore competency for the individual who is um, deemed incompetent. Um, it is really only a focus on making sure that they are properly medicated and that they, um, and then that there's a question there too of whether they want to be or not, to, or not want to be medicated. But it seems very little is, is, if anything is given to actually getting that person restored so that they can return to, try, um, to be tried for their crime. And, and I know one of the representatives was a little confused about the two things, but when someone is found non-competent until they're found competent again, they cannot stand trial for their crime. 
Um, we don't know in this case whether an insanity defense would ever have been brought, but because, and we waited nine years to see if that could happen, but it never did. Um, so I feel like we talk, we're talking a lot about public safety and we're talking a lot about the interests of the accused, particularly those who have mental illnesses, but we don't talk about the interest of the family of the victim and the public in general to bring the accused to trial. Um, and particularly once they get it caught up in the mental health system, that just disappears. Um, so uh, for us, that was a, a long journey and we never saw the end of it because of her staff, which gave us some, I'm not gonna say relief because it, you know this incident never goes away. We never saw justice for her. Um, but we're hoping that if some of these things are considered in the system and in, especially on the mental health side, and if victims are given more of an opportunity to voice their concerns in the processes. I, I totally understand the privacy issues, but there, was big, there are other issues at, in play here, not just not just this, this defendant's privacy issues. So I think that the section of the bill, so the two things, I really think the notice provisions are good. Um, I think they could be even more strengthened more, but I know there'll be pushback from a lot of different areas on that. But I feel like um, if there's any information that could be given to the victims during the process, particularly when it goes on as long as it did with our family, that um, it could, it would be very helpful. Um, so th that would encourage the evolution of this legislation. I'm not saying we can do it all at once, but I think little pieces are good. Um, I think the section on the forensic care working group, um, event identifying the gaps between the two systems and looking at other states' models is excellent. I'm very encouraged that, that there are two victims, uh, um, witnesses, or excuse me, two victims representatives now on that, um, in that bill. It wasn't there when the bill was originally drafted. I will tell you, I've been following this bill for two years. Um, I testified last year in front of the Senate committee on this bill. It was Senate Bill 183 last year. And it, it's, I think it's improved this year, actually. I think there's some things in here that really will be helpful to victims. Um, but I, and I, so I encourage you got to, as a good start, to move forward with this. Um, I feel like the one, one thing that could be done with respect to the section of the bill that sets up the forensic care working group would be to also emphasize not only the treatment interests of the accused and the interests of public safety, but the one thing that I we were so frustrated with, which is the interests of the victims and the public in bringing the accused to trial. Um, I know that's not always going to be as frustrating for people as it was in our particular case. And as Kelly said, you know, one case doesn't, doesn't dictate how everything should go for the rest of, of time, but you learn a lot of lessons when you look at, at situations like Kelly's and situations that, like my family. Um, and then, I'm sorry, I'm a little um, disjointed here, but the final thing that I wanna emphasize is just the general status of victims in the Vermont criminal system. Um, and it's not just Vermont, it's other places as well. Um, it's a struggle. Um, and I would, I would say that to emphasize that the purpose, the, the stated purpose of the law is to protect the victims of the crimes um, while balancing the crime victims' rights with the criminal defendants' rights. So what I wanna emphasize here is crime victims' rights. Um, in my experience, there is no balancing. There is no consequences associated with the failure to comply with the provisions relating to victims' rights. Um, especially, I mean, and it's understandable because when you, if you don't tiptoe around the defendant, you know, that defendant could end up going free. Um, so you want to make sure that they're given all the due process they can possibly get. But, but who is being ignored in this mix? The person who was actually the most impacted by the actions of that, that defendant um, who lost their loved ones, who were, who were injured 
who were who were all the different circumstances that could happen in a criminal case. Um, and so um, I, I just feel like even though there is a law on the books that victims and victims' families are still largely invisible in the process. And once they get into the mental health system, they're silent. And so I would really urge you to take a good hard look at this legislation. I think it's a very good start. I think this focus group can really come up with some good suggestions. Um, I know it's very difficult because there are so many different nuances that come up with all di different kinds of cases, but um, I, I think we can do better. And um, I, I don't wanna see another family have to go through 10 years of the kind of thing well, you go through it for the rest of your life, but that's not to do, nothing to do with the system. The guy, the guy who murdered her is the one who is responsible, but it's what happens to him or her once they're in the system to, to get that person to stand for their, their crime and to give the family a little bit of comfort with respect to that. Um, I feel so sorry for Kelly. I appreciated her testimony. I think she'd be a great advocate for your group. I'm willing to do whatever I can to help um, give input um, with respect to ongoing issues related to victims' rights. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, you know, so sorry for your loss, and so appreciative of your testimony and um, and and your suggestions. and And your statement is posted, um, so we'll be able to refer to that. and um, And again, thank you, thank you so much for really shedding. Um, the, an important light on on the victim and uh, the victim's family, which I understand is 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 not always a good thing. So thank you. And, and one more thing I want to say is, and I know you guys have a lot of witnesses, but just listen to what Kelly and I are saying in terms of we have nothing to gain. Our people are dead. Um, my sister's killer can never be brought to justice. We are. I mean, I've been. I've been. This has been a part of my life now for a decade. Um, and will continue to be. I'm doing my I'm doing volunteer work here in Colorado. This is where I live, um, in the volunteer, um, in the victims area, because I feel so strongly about the need for improvements. And I, I just hope you would take that into consideration when you're looking at making improvements, because it, it, they are just really needed. Thank you. Absolutely, we'll we'll take all of your testimony in, into consideration. Again, I thank you. And I do see a hand up. Are you, um, is it okay to take a question? Sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, Barbara. I thank you so much. I, I think that your testimony and um, Kelly's testimony just make this all so vivid and real for us in a way that no one else can. And I, I'm sorry, I can't imagine how hard this is. Um, so you had mentioned that um, the only communication you heard was from the state attorney. Um, that's, that's how we got our communication. We did get a few, we did get some information through the attorney general's office, um, but, but he could only give us limited information. Um, so, so I'm, I'm wondering, especially given um, your legal background and that your volunteer work also, what ideally would you like to see for communicate? Like, what, sh what should that look like so that? Well, what I, I, I can't, I'm not a legislative drafter and I, I know there's a lot of nuances here. And sure, I, yeah. I listen to the testimony. I know there's a lot of people that are gonna be telling you that any any information that is protected and it's the and and talk a lot about the due process that rights that 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 individual has and, and privacy rights. Um, so what I'm going to say is not everything is HIPAA protected. Not everything that goes on in those um, uh, places is HIPAA protected. And and I don't and and I know it's case by case and I'm not and so it becomes difficult to say this is the standard that whenever these things happen, notice should be given to the victims. But there should be some sort of liaison maybe that can work between the two systems with victims and consider the, inter the, um, the competing interests there. Mm -hmm. um, know what 
needs to be said and what can't be said and, and help the victim. The victim has no one helping them. I, 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 will, I will qualify that though. I have to say the victim's advocates on the criminal side were amazing and I really, really appreciated them. I, I looked at my emails over the 10 year period. I, I felt like that, I mean, I had an ongoing relationship with these, these women, um, but they, were, they could only give me the information they had. And I would ask, we would ask specific pointed questions about what was going on with him we would find out little bits and pieces to the extent they said we could hear it. I mean, he was doing things while he was in custody. He was got, gathering outside the, uh, on the grounds to bring them into um, the facility. He was investigating ways to open, get uh, the locks on the doors and the windows where he was on his computer. I mean, all this stuff is going on and we don't, I mean, we hear about it. Most of the time when we'd find things out it would be something that was written in the press. And I'm not gonna say the press always has the correct information because I know that's not true. But when you're, when you're sitting there and you're, you've got a, a loved one who's been killed and you don't get to talk to her and you don't, and you don't get to know what is going on with the, her killer. Um, and, and you don't know whenever, when the status of that's gonna change. You, you get a call, you get a text saying, oh, okay, something's going on right now. And then your world just changes. Well, um, and it sounded like Kelly had to like hear from people in the community. So it, it, that was a common theme in both your testimony is information and communication and like, right, who was available for you and you know, what could have made an awful time slightly better you know what i mean and, and i get it everybody the thing that i really really hit home for me was everybody has their own individual interests in the case in either protecting the person from a in a from a mental health perspective bringing justice you know getting the case going or if it's, if they can't it's stopped because he's in the mental health system so they're on to another case so the only one that has a consistent interest in what's going on is the victim um and so we'd like to see all of these different parts connect more, work together. This is what Kelly was emphasizing in her testimony. And I'll emphasize it too. Don't just say, I can't do this because blah, blah, blah. Let's look at the whole, let's look at getting the person, um, help them for goodness sakes, if they're mentally ill, absolutely. But, but also look at whether they truly are too. In my case, that's, that was the real tricky, tricky thing because he was, he was not, he had a, a, a diagnosis of um, delusional disorder, but he was not, he was not diagnosed as schizophrenic. So it's gonna be different for every different person, but somebody needs to look at all the pieces and help that victim through the process and, and get that person to trial if they really, this, this, in this case, this, this man should have been put on trial. He should have been. I'm not saying that's always the case, but in this case, he should have been. And that was very frustrating for us. Right. I mean, it seems like, like I get there's no conclusion, like up or down the trial, having a trial, at least you have your day in court, so to speak, you know? Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I really, your really appreciate you listening. Um, it, I know I'm going on and on, but you know, I have been waiting so many years. And um, I, even while the process is, even while he was still in the process, I was looking and talking to people about maybe making some legislative changes. And so I, what you guys are doing is so important. It's so important for these people, us, the people who have no voices. Um, I, and like I said, I'm, I repeat myself a little bit. I respect the fact that defendants has all the rights that they have and they need them, but please, please consider the people who are most impacted by the crime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Right. Not seeing any, any other questions. Again, thank you. Really appreciate your, your testimony. Okay, so Representative Donahue, um, do next. We only have ten minutes. Um, you're welcome to start. What what works for you? I don't want to 
I want to make sure we get all of your testimony. Yeah, I, I think at this phase, my testimony um, hopefully is not too lengthy um, because I'm not. It, it, it's not a. It's not about details or uh, mm. wordsmithing and so forth. It's kind of a overview okay. of issues. Okay, great. And um, we will continue after the floor. Um, I know you're busy with your committee, but I, I hope you're able to to come back. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you, um, Representative Van Donahue. And I want to start by saying I think there are really serious problems with our current uh, forensic law system, uh, both with gaps and with significant discrepancies within it. It has not been overhauled in I don't know how long. Um, I actually introduced a bill in uh, 2019 to try to do some overhaul work um, that followed a work group that the legislature had established on the orders of non-hospitalization which then didn't receive any follow-up from the legislature. Um, and the bill included a, a fact-finding mechanism that actually therefore enabled um, some of the actions that people would like to, to see happen. Um, but I think it's, it's really critical in looking at this bill. Um, you need to have the context uh, of the full statute um, and understand the, the revisions that need to be made in the full statute because picking out just limited pieces is gonna add to the disconnects and the discrepancies that exist. And, and at a minimum, you need to look at them to avoid increasing uh, discrepancies, um, like the, the little reference I made to, to uh, DMH being the only one uh, mentioned when in fact insanity and competence um, is not only about mental health, and there's a lot of focus on mental illness, but that is not the only part of the definition. Um, so a couple other brief examples. Um, another piece of the definition for um, mental disease or defect is a traumatic brain injury. Um, however, there is no um, outcome uh, for that possible. If a person is found not competent or insane based on a traumatic brain injury, um, there, there's, uh, there is no custody involved uh, by anyone. Um, there's no ability to place conditions um, or, or anything if they've been found um, uh, not competent or insane. And we don't even include in the definition dementia. Um, so if a person um, with serious dementia uh, commits a violent crime, which does sometimes occur, there's no ability to place any uh, conditions or restrictions like they have to have somebody with them so that they're supervised. We understand that they, uh, you know, they're not uh, criminally liable. Um, do we want to wait to again have to do reactive law when that situation arises, or do we want to incorporate looking at that as as part of a holistic picture? And probably the best legal example uh, of a conflict in the law in terms of what's changed since 30 years ago um, is. About 12 years ago, we revised the laws in acknowledgement that when somebody's being sent for an evaluation, mental evaluation, that it, the judge should not order that to be an inpatient evaluation unless the person actually needs to be in a hospital. Um, the evaluation may need to take place in corrections. It may happen in the community, um, but it shouldn't occur in a hospital unless they need to be in a hospital because our hospitals are not intended anymore to be correctional facilities or just for the purpose of, of holding someone. Um, but when we did that, we didn't, we were not consistent in other parts of the statute. So the section that was just referenced by uh, Eric this morning um, about um, the revocation of an order of non-hospitalization. So someone is not following the conditions and the court then has jurisdiction and the court can order hospitalization has absolutely no relationship to whether hospitalization is appropriate. And if you um, don't look at that, but just include the notification to the court that a person's not following their ONH, the court can pull that person in and order them into the hospital. And I can tell you our hospital system, which is already overloaded, is not the right person for somebody who doesn't need that level of care and treatment. Now, there may be a lot of other things that need to happen that may not be happening now, but being hospitalized if they don't need hospital care is not the appropriate answer. And that would be the current statutory effect. Um, the last thing I just wanna mention in terms of you know, highlights overview um, to 
what you have in front of you is I think the forensic work group, which is critically important because this is not a task that could be taken on um, in a few weeks time on Zoom, um, but it has to have the right people on it. And I think there are key ones who are missing. It has to have the right amount of time to do the work and August to November uh, does not meet that. Um, and it has to have the right charge in terms of what it ought to be doing. Um, right now, it, there are parts that are specific enough that it's actually sort of skews the outcome in terms of truly being an evaluation of what ought to happen. And I will reference at this point, I have a UVM intern who is looking at um, various states, how they handle this so that there's some ability to say, okay, here are different models, not just here is a model that we think is the one that we ought to be um, uh, do re replicating in Vermont without looking at uh, how different states um, handle it. So that's that's my um, that's my quick overview. I think there's a lot here. There's a lot that needs to be done, but it's really important um, to do it right. And by picking out things in isolation, um, there's a really significant risk of making things much worse uh, in the interim. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you, and I appreciate your testimony. And I'm I'm hoping that your committee will. Um, we'll look at um, we'll look at the working group, um, um, but at the very least, I really welcome your um, your thoughts on who who should be on it, who you know who isn't on it, as well as um, as well as the charge and the and the timeline, and and um, perhaps that will come from your committee. Um, and we'll yeah, that's in that. a lot of ways that's the easier part, <laughs> right? Than trying to you know grapple with the the underlying um, statutes, but sure, okay. The um, questions, Barbara, I see your hand up. It might've been from before. Uh, any other questions? No, okay, well, thank, thank you, Anne. Thank you, everybody. It's been- I, a I, I actually, I'm sorry, I, I, I need to make one thing. I, I did not mean, and I think um, from some comments it may have been understood, I did not mean in any way to suggest um, that there are not victims involved. Um, and I think that that may have been uh, misunderstood by a comment I made. Um, you know, I, I think that sort of thing is really easily remedied by simply saying uh, a victim of a crime for which the person has been charged. You know, that that result. But there's, I mean, there's no question about there being a victim. Um, I just think we shouldn't. Um, uh, the, not all cases are completely clear as to um, somebody who has not been convicted as to whether um, we're in a sense saying we're convicting you. All right, thank, thank you. you, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that, for that clarification. Okay, all right, again, thank you everybody. It's been a, a long morning, but certainly very, very important and only a start of the conversation. Um, I'm not sure how long we'll be on the floor. But my understanding is um, we are only looking at one thing today, so 15 minutes after the floor, we will continue working on the bill. And I really appreciate the, um, the witnesses that we'll be hearing from in the afternoon and, and possibly Friday for, for your flexibility. So, okay, thank you. So Evan, if we could please go off YouTube.